pleasure today to welcome you to the 19th HW Art Lecture. I'd like to start by acknowledging that today we're meeting on the lands of the Nambri and Ngunnawal people um, here in the place that we call Cambri, and I pay my deep respects to First Nations people, the elders past and present. It's wonderful to have Professor Douglas Irwin here from Dartmouth College to present the 19th lecture today. And in fact, as I understand, it's been quite a few years in the making. Uh, last year, Paul came around to my office with a, a huge grin to tell me that finally this would be happening. So welcome um, very much here, Professor Irwin. The art lecture series honours the contribution to the Australian National University and to Australian academic life of Professor Heinz Art, who was professor and emeritus professor at the Australian National University for 50 years. He's one of the most published and influential Australian economists for many years and a global pioneer in the study of development economics and Asian economic development, with a particular focus on our key, key near neighbour, Indonesia. He established the ANU Indonesia project, which was launched in 1965 and which continues to have a significant impact. And I'm delighted to see some of our colleagues who have made such a huge contribution to that here with us today. The HW Art Lecture is hosted by the Art Corden Department of Economics, one of our departments here in the Crawford School of Public yeah. Policy. The department works on key problems in economics with an emphasis on Australia, the Asia Pacific and global challenges. And the department also nurtures the new generation of economic minds through graduate certificate, masters and PhD training. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I had the privilege to be in the room for three days with our latest um, PhD students, many of them from the department. And it was just extraordinary to hear about their ambitions and aspirations and what brought them to study with us. Professor John, um, Sir John Crawford was the first head of department. He was followed by Professor Heinz Arndt and Professor Max Corden, after whom the department is today named. Today, the intellectual quest of the department continues to be shared by scholars of economics, now headed by Professor Paul Burke, who's here with us tonight. I hope you will enjoy what I know will be a very thought-provoking lecture tonight. The lecture is being recorded and will be posted online after the event. I'd like to remind everybody to check that their phones are off. I'll do the same in my pocket right now. <laughs> um, and it's my pleasure now to introduce my colleague, Associate Professor Yishol Jo, to the convener of the Aunt Lecture Series, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you very much. <laughs> Can you for the introduction and opening of the lecture? Um, so tonight, I have the great pleasure to introduce to you Professor Douglas Owen uh, as the speaker. Um, so, Professor Douglas Owen is John French Professor of Economics at Dartmouth College. He is the author of uh, Clashing Over Commerce. A History of Women's Trade Policy, published by the University of Chicago Press uh, in 2017. Uh, this book was selected uh, as one of the best books of the year by The Economist and Foreign Affairs. And for over many years, Professor um, Douglas Earl has been a prolific uh, author on the topics uh, regarding trade policy and economic history, uh, both in the format of books and uh, professional journals. So tonight, uh, we are very lucky, and we have uh, Professor Douglas Earl with us and addressing a very challenging and uh, important question. And the question he raises is, is globalization in retreat? Um, so he will share with us his insights on what we can learn from the past waves of globalization to help us guide us to help guide us through this new era. Uh, thank you, Professor. So the floor is yours. But it's an absolute honor and a pleasure to be here uh, to give the Heinz Art lecture. Unfortunately, I never knew Heinz Art. I knew uh, Max Corden, but I knew Heinz through his work. And uh, there are a couple of works that have been particularly influential in terms of my thinking. Uh, and that I recommend to you. So the book on the left, Economic Development, is a really interesting uh, tour de force on how economic thought on development has changed over time. Uh, his memoir in the middle sort of tells you, tells you about his life, his institution building, um, and some of his uh, changes in views over time. Um, and then the book, which I think is most relevant for uh, what I'm going to be talking about today, is the Economic Lessons of the 1930s. And of course, if you read his memoir, you'll know that the 1930s loomed large in his life and the question is whether they're going to loom large uh, with us today. 
Um, so uh, there's a lot of talk in the US and around the world about deglobalization, uh, about the fragmentation of the world economy as a result of various pressures that I'll be getting into. But the question is, does that talk, uh, how does it manifest itself and what are we to make of it? Um, so the question I hope to address is whether we're in a new era of globalization, which globalization is in retreat. And here's some of the th themes that I want to uh, address um, and points I want to make to you. First of all, we are coming off of a remarkable period in human history in terms of the global integration that we've experienced just over the past few decades. However, the past drivers of globalization have stalled, if not gone into reverse, um, there's also the return of geopolitics, which has major economic implications, whether we like it or not. And finally, I hope to do this and talk about uh, these themes through the lens of history. And in order to understand sort of where we are, I want to bring us up to date in terms of how we got here. And the lens of history, I think, can be a very useful one for understanding these things. Now, the, the framework, in, in, to the extent I have one to talk about these things, is sort of based on what uh, the newest uh, Nobel laureate in economics, Claudia Golden, and her husband did. Harvard, uh, Larry Katz have written about in terms of trying to understand the skill premium in the United States mainly, and they talk, talk, think about it as a race between technology and education. So if technology accelerates, but the level of the skilled workforce doesn't keep up, the skill premium is going to rise. And if technology lags off, but this, the number of educated workers continues to increase, then the skill premium might, might decline. Well, we can think about global integration in sort of a similar way. It's a race in some sense between technology and policy. So technology, which is always advancing at various uh, paces, is bringing markets together, or can bring markets together. Policy, however, can be either an accelerator to that process or a break on that process. And so the two are sort of working in tandem. And the question is, are they working in the same direction or are they working at cost purposes? So sometimes they can go in opposite directions. So, how are we to think about global economic integration? As you know, globalization is a very broad term. It means a whole bunch of things. It, talk, it means uh, something about capital flows across countries, technology flows, migration and labor movements as well. I'm just gonna focus on the trade side for the moment and just show you this picture, which goes back to about 1825, which shows the world trade divided by world GDP, world exports and imports divided by world GDP. And there are various series, some historical, some more up to date, the date of this, but it, the general pattern is exactly the same. So this is the broad pattern, but what you might see is that there are some inflection points where the thing, where the numbers change in terms of whether we're rising in terms of integration or falling in terms of disintegration. And these identify for us five eras of globalization. So what are these eras of globalization uh, uh, have to, what's going on in them and, and what's uh, going on today? So if you look at that first one, um, you can see the general a gradual rise in the trade to GDP ratio. <clears throat> and that, of course, is because technology was improving to bring markets together. So this little picture here shows you all the technologies in one chart. So you can see the steamship in the upper right. You can see the railroad, which was introduced in the early 19th century. You can see someone with the telegraph here, transatlantic cable, of course, laid. Um, you see the machinery of the Industrial Revolution on the left there, reducing production costs. Yeah. And so all these factors, the world was changing rapidly in the early 19th century in a way that reduced trade costs and uh, led to increased integration. And of course, we have pictures of these things too later in the 19th century, but we have this long period where technology is a force towards uh, moving markets uh, closer together. But it was also policy. Policy was moving in the same direction. Now, we all heard about the, uh, uh, the unilateral repeal of the Corn Laws by Great Britain in 1846. But in terms of trade policy that had a broader implication for Western Europe and the world economy, it's the Cobden Chevalier Treaty of 1860. You may not have heard of it, but it was sort of the first stepping stone to a broader range of trade agreements across Western Europe. Here are the negotiators uh, John Bright in the middle, Richard Cobden on the left, uh, uh, Michel Chevalier, uh, the French minister. Um, and they uh, reached this trade agreement uh, in 1860. It was just a bilateral agreement, but it had much more important effects. Um, it's interesting also to note the motivation for that trade agreement. It was only partly economics. It was mainly geopolitics. Uh, that is, Richard Cobden was a committed free trader, but he was also committed to worldwide peace. And he thought free trade would act as a principle of gravitation to bring people together and unite them in bonds of eternal peace. Whether you think that's a naive idea or not, that was animating and motivating uh, uh, 
thought for him in trying to push, push this forward. Now, why was that important? Well, if you go to Wikipedia and you type in how many times did France and Britain fought, well, basically it's 1109 to 1815, it's hard to find years when they were not fighting. So this in some sense was not just a trade agreement to increase bilateral trade, it was a peace pact. It was a peace pact to stop this fighting across the English Channel, which had gone on for century after uh, century. Um, and they still fight, of course, but it's just Brexit and other things like that, uh, not a war. But what happened with the, this bilateral agreement is that other countries wanted to get also access to the markets of Britain and France. And so they wanted to sign their own agreements. And when they did, they wanted to sign one with the uh, other third parties. And I know uh, Professor Jagdish Gwadi, I believe, has given this lecture before, and he invented this term or coined this term spaghetti bowls of preferential trade arrangements overlapping and, and contradicting one another. Uh, and this has been called the mother of all spaghetti bowls because everything was bilateral, nothing was multilateral. Um, in fact, Britain had a very different approach to trade policy than the U.S. The U.S. Want, had traditionally wanted rules and agreements. Britain wasn't involved in this. They had unilateral free trade. It was the other countries that were reaching this, and Britain had no interest in having an uh, overarching organization to bring all these trade agreements together. But as we see, uh, there's this general rise. Uh, it sort of tapers off towards the late 19th century. But the background to this period, of course, is that picture there, Pax Britannica. That is, there was a period of European peace because of dominance of the British economy and, and British politics and the British Navy keeping the sea lanes open. And so we can't ignore that backdrop to seeing this general, gentle rise in global trade. Of course, then we have this transition and we can see what happens during that transition, this period of deglobalization. Um, and of course, it was World War I that sort of sparked that. There had been some uh, tariffs beforehand. Um, but what we see there is a decline. And of course, there are multiple shocks here. There's, first of all, there's World War I. There's the very sort of difficulties of reparations and the uh, establishment of stabilization in the 1920s. Then we had the Great Depression, a shock on top of that. And then we have World War II. So all of these are sort of negative policy shocks, not, even, not policy shocks, but um, uh, shocks to the global economy that's pushing disintegration. I'll get to policy in just a moment. And of course, the backdrop there is German militarism. Uh, which had upset the geopolitics of that long 19th century peace and led us into a new era of globalization. Of course, there were policy errors, and here's where the U.S. takes some blame as well. You might have heard of the Smoot-Hawley Tariff, the last tariff act passed by Congress in 1930. On the left-hand side here shows that actually professors of economics knew what was coming if that tariff act was passed and warned the president to, uh, against it, urged him to veto it. Of course, it didn't happen. Sparked a trade war. I've written a short book on the smooth Valley tariff and the politics behind it. Uh, it led to a lot of retaliation against uh, the United States. Interesting, when the Trump administration imposed tariffs, all the advisors within the administration said, no other country will retaliate. Same thing was said back then. Of course, countries do retaliate uh, when uh, you upset uh, their exports. And what happened was a downward plug hole of world trade this cycling down as countries retaliated, as there's deflationary policies um, and uh, uh, world trade uh, utterly collapsed, not just in value terms, but in volume terms by about 50% uh, uh, during this period. I've written another book on that if you were interested in the 1930s to complement Heinz Arndt's book on this. But then we begin to move towards another transition in the US when this economic disaster comes home to roost and leads to political change in the United States. The, Roosevelt administration, uh, Franklin Roosevelt is elected. He appoints Cordell Hall as Secretary of State, the longest serving Secretary of State in US history, who eventually won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1945 for creating the UN, but uh, he was also an inveterate free trader and wanted trade agreements to open up the channels of world commerce to bring the world out of the Great Depression. And it wasn't just for the economic benefits, it was because of the adverse political ramifications of having protectionism. Uh, and he wanted countries to get along. He said, he'll, he'll never falter in my belief that enduring peace and welfare of nations is linked to the maximum practical degree of international trade. And he learned that lesson as a result of World War I, and he wanted to apply it to avoid World War II, which of course did not happen, but he moved US trade policy in a different direction. Here's a little plug from my home state of New Hampshire. Uh, part of the Roosevelt administration's approach was to get countries to cooperate on monetary matters as well as trade matters. And the monetary conference took place in, in New Hampshire, about two hours from where I live, at Bretton Woods. And yes, we have sheep in New Hampshire as well, as we did in 1944. Um, it looks a little bit different today. No more sheep, but there's a golf course, and there's about Washington in the background there. Uh, and if you're ever in the New England area, it's a very nice place to visit. They still have a room where the articles of agreement the IMF were signed. 
and a couple, bunch of other uh, uh, things you can see. Uh, but once again, what was the rationale for trying to bring the world together to uh, knit the ties of uh, global economy? It wasn't just economic uh, recovery, it was bringing about a peaceful world. So as Roosevelt said, we cannot succeed in building a peaceful world, must we build an economically healthy world? Same thing was said by his successor, Harry Truman, who said in 1947 that everyone is, the focus of policymakers is on peace and freedom. And he said, these objectives are bound up with a third objective, the reestablishment of world trade. In fact, the three, peace, freedom, and world trade are inseparable. The grave lessons of the past have proved it. So there was this view in the United States that these things go together. There's a postage stamp in the United States, which sort of makes this explicit. There's a political cartoon from uh, the Washington Post by a very famous uh, cartoonist, Herbenlock, that sort of explains the, ration, the thinking of so many people during this period. So here's tra trade freedom at the bottom. And it's supporting political cooperation. And political cooperation is supporting world peace. But who are the bad guys? The tariff lobbies out there trying to disturb trade freedom, which is the underpinning what the possibilities would might be for the world, for the world after, uh, after World War II. So I want to come back to that theme a little bit later on when we talk about uh, things today. So what happens in 1947, this is where the trade arrangements are set up with the GATT in, uh, in Geneva, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which morphed into the WTO in 1995. And what we see here is a rebound in world trade with recovery, with peace. Um, um, and, but what you can see, if you look at it suddenly, is in the 1960s and into the 70s, it sort of flattens out. And it does go up uh, after 1973. Those are, those are oil price shocks. So it's not really more integration. It's just the price of oil has gone up and people need to trade more. So it's, and, and if you look by before the oil shocks, we're not where we were in 1913. We hadn't gotten up to that level. That's because sometimes we call this the multilateral system of the IMF, World Bank, and GATT, but it really wasn't multilateral. Why? Geopolitics. So what we had is the Soviet-US split. And so the world was not united, it was very much divided. In fact, you all have heard the terms, the three worlds, the first world, the second world, and the third world. We don't have to use those terms as much anymore, but the third, first world, the blue countries, where Western countries, mainly democracies, on the same page in terms of being market-oriented and what have you. The second world, the red, the communist countries, which were centrally planned, isolationist to some extent in terms of their economies, not engaged in a great deal of trade with the rest of the world. And the third world, the global south, if you will, uh, which was not aligned, pursued import substitution policies, was not well integrated in the world economy for many, many decades after World War II. That is why that trade to GDP ratio was attenuated uh, in the 1960s and 1970s. But the world changed again. So we have another inflection point. The whole world changes between 1985 and 1995. And those three distinctions don't make sense anymore. China's open for business, as is Vietnam. Soviet Union collapses. Berlin Wall comes down. Eastern Europe wants to reintegrate with Western Europe. Um, the global south begins to open up in terms of their trade policies. So once again, we get something approaching an open world economy. And that leads to this fourth period of globalization right here, where you can see that these things just skyrocket. And they skyrocket because we're taking these three worlds and we made them into one world. Everyone wants to be a member of the WTO. Everyone is largely going to be market oriented. Uh, and world trade just uh, soars as a result of that, this, uh, this development. What were the two, the two drivers? As I said, technology and policy, and they're both driving in the same direction. In the 1930s, they were going in opposite directions. Here, they're moving in the same direction. So technology reveals itself in terms of lower transport costs, which is due to containerization and freight, and policy is lower trade barriers. So here's just a forthcoming article in the Journal of Economic Literature on declining transport costs, declining about 50% uh, in, in for much of the post-war period, but certainly continuing into the 1990s and 2000s. And just remind ourselves in terms of what was the technology. This is the old way of moving things uh, into from, even from the 1930s, barrels and bags. And now we have containers. So we wonder why those costs have gone down. And of course, we have major ports now that can offload and unload these things incredibly fast. Um, now, of course, some things can happen. Uh, it doesn't always work out the way we wanted to. Um, we can lose these containers. And the most famous container that we lost contained rubber ducks. 
And it fell off somewhere between Hong Kong and Los Angeles. And it was a boom to oceanographers around the world because they could track these things floating around the world, uh, reaching Europe in 2007, uh, more than 15 years, about 15 years after the initial container went over. Um, and of course, they land on the shores of Northern Australia as well. Um, so we can learn some things even from uh, these little disasters. Um, and if you want more, there's a whole book on uh, the uh, Robert Ducky disaster of, uh, by 1992. Think of how we offloaded cars in 1971 and even into the early 1980s. What do you notice here? First of all, often one by one with a lot of people. There are about five or six uh, uh, longshoremen there. How do we do it today? There's specialized ships that just take cars uh, from Asia to North America and elsewhere. Now, of course, there can be problems there too. And so Kia lost about 2,000 cars when they didn't load their ship correctly. It, it uh, turned and all the uh, car uh, your cargo spilled. But by and large, once again, this is facilitating global trade. And there are other technological developments as well, but there's also major policy development. So if we just look at indicators of our countries opening up or not, notice from 1985 to 1995, there's this wave of countries changing their trade trends in a major, major way. Um, tariffs came down, quantitative restrictions were relaxed, if not abolished. Um, and as a result, we get this explosion in uh, uh, the trade to GDP ratio. So before we get to the present, I just want to remind us about what happened during that decade, two decades, in the late 1980s and about the global financial crisis. It is truly of historic import what happened during that period. It changed the face of the globe in our life. How so? Well, if we go back and look at income distribution in the 1800s, when I sort of started my slides, the Industrial Revolution is just starting. Basically, everyone's poor. There's a uniform distribution of income, a few rich. By 1975, of course, we have two worlds, bimodal distribution of world income. Why? Because we have the industrialized West, where incomes have risen, and the rest of the world where they haven't industrialized, incomes are still relatively low. So we have the rich and the poor in the world. And as a result, global economic inequality is just going in one direction. It's going up and up and up. There's no convergence between rich and poor. The rich are growing faster than the poor countries. And the global Gini coefficient uh, of, global, of inequality keeps going up. That's why in 1997, in the Journal of Economic Perspectives, uh, Lant Pritchett, a development economist, wrote this article called Divergence Big Time. And the world economy was not coming together, there was divergence. The problem is that was written exactly at the time when things were beginning to change in a different way. And what we see between the 1980s and 2000 is, first of all, the distribution of income moves to the right. It becomes much more uniform. The global South is caught up, there's convergence, those lower incomes are rising more rapidly, and the entire world has changed, um, and the world income distribution has changed. So if we look at the global income distribution, it just keeps marching to the right, and it's no longer bimodal, it becomes unimodal. Uh, and so what happens? Global inequality falls. In the past 20 years, we erased a century worth of increased global inequality in 20 years because of what's happened in China and Vietnam and so many other countries around the world. That is an astounding, once again, think about modern history. This is a very unique period in global economic history. What city is this? You have no idea? Who said Seoul first? Why, why did you say that? It actually is Seoul. Uh, this is taken by David Cole of USAID himself in 1965 when he first went to Seoul. What are they doing here? Washing clothes. What does South Korea export now? Washing machines. <laughs> That's what's happened in one generation. Here's Seoul in 1960. Here it is today. Isolation to openness in terms of trade, openness to technology, many, many stories like this. And here it is today, of course. This is this utter revolution of bringing countries up. And of course, the question is, what does it take for a country to make such a transition? But this region of the world, we're seeing just this global poverty. 
Total population level global poverty is defined, as you know, by about a billion people, most of it in East Asia and the Pacific, some of it in South Asia, Africa, which historically has been sort of the least globalized regions of the world. If you're thinking about the future of globalization, it's Africa. Africa recently signed, a, a, many African countries signed a, a free trade agreement. So there's a push to try to move towards a greater integration, not only themselves, but the rest of the world as well. We'll have to see how that pays off. Here's just a snapshot to show you what's happened to global poverty during this period. So it's 1993, obviously a lot of it in China, much of it in India, of course, Africa in yellow and what have you. This 1993, let's fast forward 20 years. Boom. The reduction in global poverty. Okay, not a lot in Indonesia, uh, some in India, less in Africa, Latin America goes down, but that's just, once again, in our lifetime, an astounding uh, development. So this era, which is often decried in the United States as a neoliberal era, which is awful and we ought to be repudiated and, you know, how terrible it was, austerity, politics, and all that, it's historically unique. Uh, impressive global growth with convergence, not divergence, with poverty reduction, not poverty increases. But there's always a catch, and the catch is it depended on benign geopolitics. That is this period after the fall of the Berlin Wall until the global financial crisis, or shortly thereafter, China was interested in getting rich. Russia was just interested in stabilizing. U.S. power was basically uncontested. Yes, mistakes were made, but it was generally an era in which you didn't have to worry about great power politics. And it was this unilateral moment, a unipolar moment of, once again, historically unique, but harkens back a little bit to uh, the late 19th century. Okay, so now we're in region five. So what's going on? Uh, these things have now flattened out. There was a worry that they were actually declining, but they seem to have rebounded, but they're certainly not increasing the way they had. Um, and we are in a different era of globalization ever since the global financial crisis. So this is from the World Bank's uh, Global Economic Prospects just released. Um, talked about global trade is flatlined and populism is taking its toll. Uh, and there's some good reasons and bad reasons for that flat. So a friend of my, old friend of mine uh, from Washington, uh, Herb Stein, who was an economic advisor to President Nixon and others, he said, if something can't go on forever, it will stop. So that rise in that global integration, um, it, it really can't go on forever. There's sort of a natural limiting point. Why? If you take your tariffs from 60% to 10%, you're going to get a big boost in trade. If you reduce it from 10% to 5%, you'll boost trade, but smaller at the margin. A lot of the big work was done in terms of opening these economies, and it doesn't lead to ever increasing uh, trade shares. Um, so there are a couple of things that have been expected since 2009, and a couple of things that are sort of unexpected. So transport innovations. You know, once you got the container and you take advantage of it, okay, it's there. You get sort of one-off gains. Uh, stalled trade reforms. You know, once you bring those tariffs way down, it's either it's harder to bring down further and you just don't get the, the greater, greatest gains you've had before. But of course, we've also had the unexpected. We've had a US-China trade war, pandemic, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, national security concerns about uh, China and semiconductors in Taiwan, what have you. And all these have changed the debate, at least in the United States, and I think around the world in terms of where trade policy is going. So it turns out, you know, everyone thought, Coronavirus, that is a big blow to globalization. Is it the end of globalization? No, no. The world economy and world trade bounced right back. Then less than a year, we were back where we were, um, despite the initial decline. So it's, this is compared to the 2008 financial crisis, where it took many, many uh, quarters to get back to where we were. Um, the bounce back from COVID was pretty uh, quick in terms of globalization. But the big one, of course, that's not going away is the clash between the US and China, which have been brewing even though the Trump administration really sort of accelerated things by imposing uh, uh, tariffs. And this, of course, is also partly a legacy of that global financial crisis because President Xi, I think, has taken China in a very different direction than his predecessors had been. And the Chinese economic model, which had been moving to some extent towards markets, began moving away from markets and went to more state control. And that sort of led to almost inevitability of clashes uh, between the U.S. and China. So here we have a, a book by um, Nick Lardy on the end of economic reform in China. The state strikes back, where he sort of documents how the state is creeping back in. And uh, certainly this is uh, well known now. Uh, and post-COVID uh, 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 strategy of China uh, looking inward. And so things really didn't change where it's not dumb shell things world anymore. 
It's not just the US-China clash, of course, it's there's this fragmentation of the world in terms of its views and other things has changed. So we, I talked about those three worlds and how the third world was separate from the first world, not just in terms of economic policy, in terms of political attitudes. There's a lot of discussion now about how the politics of these countries are not the same. And you see this when you look at UN votes, among many other things. Uh, this is the vote on uh, whether to condemn Russia or not for its invasion of Ukraine. It may have come as some surprise to many in the United States that not everyone cares around the rest of the world. Uh, we thought, of course, we'd condemn it, as did Western Europe and Australia. Violation of borders and, and what have you. Uh, but the rest of the world, it's not the same. And so some of the old fragmentation politically that we had seen after World War II in terms of the three worlds, it's creeping back into global politics. As a result, the number of trade restrictions being imposed has been going up. And so there's just the IMF tally of these increased in, in trade restrictions it tends to be piecemeal, this sector, that sector, rather than across the board tariffs like we saw in the Great Depression. But there's no doubt that this is moving in one direction and there's very little push or momentum for uh, reform as there had been in the 1990s. So what are the consequences of this fragmentation? Trade in going forward is less going to be an engine of growth, less a force to push the world together in terms of global equality, and protectionism uh, reduces efficiency and has uh, major costs. So, what are those? So, how can we see some of these things? So, this is just looking at the log deviation of per capita GDP. And as you can see, it fell once again in the 2000s as the poor countries were catching up to richer countries, but it sort of flattened out a bit. Okay, the reform process and the growth of trade is just not that uh, working that same way uh, before. So, this chart here, we thought, oh, global inequality is going way down. Uh, it's probably going to flatten out. It's not going to be, it's not going to reverse itself completely and go back to the same levels in the early 19th century. There are a lot of economic models out there that talk about what are the costs of political fragmentation, geopolitical fragmentation, economic retaliation, economic nationalism, what have you. So this is a tally uh, collected by um, the IMF, looking at various different studies. And of course, depending on the scenario you want to consider, you're going to get larger numbers or smaller numbers, but the point is these are all negative. These are all costs. These are all efficiency losses as a result of more trade barriers, more subsidies, and less global trade. Here's one the WTO has collected um, in terms of a simulation the WTO has run in terms of looking at the impact on various countries in terms of a decoupling scenario between the US and China. And once again, it's not positive for anyone. Uh, and whether you're the more exposed or less exposed, you're going to uh, uh, feel some costs. These may just seem like numbers, and it may be that growth paths just sort of flatten out. What that means is cumulatively big losses in potential standards of living over time as these things accumulate. And of course, Australia is not immune either. Mm -hmm. And so your former colleague, Rod Tires, has done some simulations about what happens if tariffs go up between the U.S. and China, apparently China and Australia, and it could cost Australia 6% of GDP. Um, so once again, we can discuss numbers, but uh, nothing is positive here. Just to tell you what's going on in the U.S., the U.S. trade debate is a sea change from the way it was 20 years ago or so. Um, there's bipartisan consensus that China is a major threat economically, politically, geostrategically. There's a complete change in uh, priorities of policymakers, both in the Trump administration and carried over into the Biden administration, I think future ones as well. Geopolitics is more important than economics. If we have to take this economic hit of one or 2% of GDP, we'll pay it to ensure greater security um, or inflicting uh, losses on others. Efficiency, efficiency is almost a bad term in Washington today. Um, and I have some slides later on, which I can show you about quotes of administration officials saying, you know what? Security is more important than efficiency. Efficiency means race to the bottom, cutting costs. We're not into that. It's just astounding. And remarkably, no interest in the WTO on either side of the aisle. This is something the U.S. had nurtured and created after World War II with the gap and going over to the WTO. Very little interest in that. So President Trump has written in his own hands, trade is bad. <laughs> this is Bob Woodward's book. And it's so remarkable that he just, you know, is just not typeset. He doesn't type in trade is bad. He wanted to show on the document that he got from the White House, the president writing, Unprompted by advisors, trade is bad. And that attitude is not shifted with the Biden administration um, for reasons we can get into. 
Um, so rules, rules-based system. You've heard of that term? That, that's 20th century thinking. Uh, so the US is not interested in this. Hearts don't beat faster for a rules-based order. If you're worried about security, security of supplies and what have you. Um, this is from the Wall Street Journal. The rules-based order is quietly disintegrating. And it's not just the WTO, it's, it's uh, other things as well. Here's a senator, a Republican senator, conservatives who used to support the trade order saying the WTO ought, ought to be abolished. Now, of course, this shows some ignorance because the US can't abolish the WTO. The US can withdraw from the WTO, but it's not up to the United States to with, with, uh, abolish it. Um, but that just tells you about the mindset of people on both sides of the aisle. It's not, of course, the US alone that's doing this. China, too has made all sorts of arrangements. So if the WTO in some reason collapsed, of course there's a ministerial going on right now, um, they've got backup measures in terms of other trade agreements and other trade uh, facilitation measures to ensure that it can conduct trade and keep trade open because there are huge benefits, of course, to doing so. So what's the alternative to a rules-based system? And once again, here's where the politics and the economics are interrelated because if you have political fragmentation and countries don't agree and UN votes or other things, it's gonna be very hard to reach agreements on trade matters particularly when you view trade through very different lenses. It's going to be a power-based system. And so countries are going to do what they want, throw around their power to the extent they have it. Smaller countries, of course, don't have the leverage. And it's going to be a very different world uh, to the extent this, this takes place. I'm almost done. I want to just say, uh, is there any good news here? <laughs> There's some glimmers, of course. Uh, first of all, there had been a debate, at least in the US, about two years ago or so about those trade indicators going down. And they seem to have come back. Trade integration is not increasing by the measure that I showed you, but it's not going down. Um, and there's some evidence that uh, the reduction in, the, in the, those numbers was a figment of the data. So we'll need a few more years to figure out, but it could be that there's not this disintegration going on. There's just a, a, a non-increase, a stabilization in that trade share. The second point is it's very hard to unravel globalization. This is something that I think both people in the Trump administration or during the Trump period and in the Biden administration have realized as well. You know, Apple Computer says it wants to pull out of, or at least diversify away from China. And it shows you its plans. And if you look at those plans, in five years, they hope to take their share of iPhone production from 100% to 90%. Because the advantages of operating in China are just so overwhelmingly powerful. Uh, Status quo bias. You know, one reason why that run, run up and that, that liberalization took place is so remarkable because it was pushing against special interests that didn't want to see that. And now what we have is an integrated world and trying to pull that apart. Also, you're going to have special interests that will resist that. Uh, not just companies in the United States, but around the world that benefit from that integration process. The rest of the world moves on. So the US and China may be uh, you know, confronting these uh, conflicts, but as I mentioned, Africa signed an internal free trade agreement on African countries. They're also looking abroad as well. Um, other countries, economic nationalism has returned and trade barriers have gone up, but not so much in Latin America and elsewhere. So there's still hope that other countries around the world are still integrated, still interested in being integrated in the world economy. One of the disturbing parts of the debate in the United States is this view that, oh, trade doesn't lead to peace. It didn't happen with China. You know, they, they got richer, but it didn't lead to more peace. I think that's overstated, and uh, we could come back to this in the questions and answers, but um, it didn't buy us peace. But you know, the debate may be very different if 10, 20 years from now, if China didn't attack Taiwan, we might say, actually, the calculation in China was the cost of doing so might be so high as they have been for Russia invading Ukraine, it's not worth it. So the jury is out. Uh, just because the U.S. and the national security crowd in Washington think we're on this inevitable clash doesn't mean that clash will happen in a way that destroys this idea that trade and peace and independence are mutually important. So where do I want to leave you? I just want you to appreciate that the years we've lived through, the past few decades, have been remarkable. And they go down the history books as an incredible period of growth, integration, poverty reduction, convergence. So it's absolutely remarkable. Second of all, we have been this past this inflection point for about the past 10 or 15 years or so since the global financial crisis it sort of rolled out in various ways. And I wouldn't say globalization is in retreat. I would say that globalization has been attenuated by various factors, policy, 
geopolitics and what have you, uh, that haven't reversed it and unrolled it, but do create problems for it going forward. But the, the rules-based system is definitely eroded and it's gonna be very hard to repair unless there's trust between countries and particular trust between the US and China. And I don't see that happening anytime soon. And geopolitics is by its very nature become fragmented. And when you have political fragmentation, it's very hard to sustain trade cooperation because of lack of respect and uh, 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 between countries. In terms of the future, the US can change. I think the question is, China, well, what's China going to be doing? Um, not to blame them for the fallout between the US and uh, China, but uh, things did change with President Xi and they could change back too. We don't know the future direction. Um, it could be a permanent new path they're on, in which case we're going to have greater fragmentation. But there also might be hope that China will need to sustain its economy through uh, greater trade integration might change its, its policy. So I'll just close with this uh, a quote from uh, Gideon Rockman, a columnist at the Financial Times, who said that for all the discontent that hyperglobalization created, I suspect that in decades to come, the period from 1989 to 2022 will be seen as a golden age of peace and prosperity. The world may soon discover that globalization is the worst possible system apart from all the alternatives. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor, for an amazing talk. So we will now open the floor to questions. And um, we have about actually 15 minutes for Q&A. Uh, we have two volunteers um, who helped out with the microphone today. Please indicate if you have a question. And please can be uh, briefly mention your name and uh, 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 where you're from and uh, some of the major or uh, um, work. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor, for the presentation. So I'm so I'm yeah, yeah, I'm student here in Java class for public policy. I'm taking a public policy. I'm wondering, uh, just to say that we are in, we are now entering the fragmentation era. So I'm wondering how this era affect the most of the third world country, countries or the developing countries. Because you, you uh, I think, not really mentioned on that effect to the to those countries. Because we know that most of the developing countries have a significant dependency. Into like uh, to the to the US China, particularly in terms of technology. So I think it will be like significance. They will like both of the or each the countries or the countries will will try to 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 have like to expand their influence in the developing countries. So thank you. Uh, so, well, first of all, the implication is they're going to be facing a lot of headwinds and a lot of difficult choices, because when the world was sort of one in the WTO, the question is, do you join the WTO or not? And now the question is, who do you want to be aligned with? And do you need a special agreement with them? Because it could be, and the U.S. I know has asked this of Australia, New Zealand, and other countries, is you got to pick sides to some extent in terms of the, which technology standards you want. If you have two different standards that are not compatible, uh, in terms of goods and the access you're going to get. So it creates more difficulties for the developing countries going forward. And that's exactly why the convergence process that we've seen was sort of easy during the period when it was just the WTO, one sort of system and standard. You open up and things can work. You have access to markets around the world. Now you see some of them blocked, depending on the political preferences or the, the politics of the particular countries. So that's why geopolitics is this uh, corroding force for the trading system. Uh, because once again, you can't really separate out the politics and the uh, economics. And we have been for the 90s and 2000s, politics, it, it wasn't a major concern. Uh, and now, so uh, there's going to be greater headwinds. It's going to be uh, less robust growth. And that means fewer opportunities. So the charts of convergence and poverty reduction, what have you, is going to be harder to sustain that over time. Uh, hi, Professor Arlen. Uh, my name is Rich Wong. I'm a tutor from the Regional School of Economics, as well as in Farm Corbin Economics Incorporated. Uh, so, my question is that so, Fred, thank you for the presentation and enlightening me on the uh, globalization trend recently. 
Um, so I think you mentioned that to your, your speech to link to so the, the native sector, which is one is the trade, the global trade system, the other one is the global geopolitics system. Uh, but I think that there is another sector of globalization, which is the global financial markets. And well, the reason I bring it out that it's a very special, and uh, we can see that it wasn't really important before the 19th century, but it becomes very important, especially after the GFC. And we see that there's a huge risk within the global financial sector. But one, one crisis in the United States triggered the whole, the whole real sector to fluctuate a lot. And, uh, and the special thing that the global financial market is very dependent on US companies, our Federal Reserve. Federal Reserve is dependent on US policy. And one reason, the particular reason for US to be so special in world trade is that the, the special position of US are that a lot of trade that even though the, the uh, Chinese run has been rising, the European dollar has the Euros have been rising, US dollar still has a special. Position and the IMF is basically uh, very dependent of US government. So I'd like to hear what is your opinion, what is your perspective to the future of financial globalization? Well, so first of all, just on the history, uh, it was in the late 19th century, there's uh, incredible international financial integration uh, under the gold standard, and there are massive uh, capital flows from Britain to other countries, such as Australia. Um, to help build railroads and, and uh, finance infrastructure. So there was a great deal of uh, financial integration in the 19th century. Uh, there was lost during that interwar period, and that loss continued into the early post-war period on the Bretton Woods, where we had capital controls and fixed exchange rates and the like. And you're right that, that uh, finance came back later than trade did, um, only with uh, deregulation in the 1980s and what happened. And of course, like those technology, so Larry Summers, former Secretary of the Treasury of the United States, former uh, President of Harvard University, always talks about the, the jet airline or aircraft, is saying these are incredibly impressive uh, technological achievements that achieve us, that allow us to travel much more uh, rapidly. Uh, but when the crashes happen, they're, they're shut down. Uh, and we saw that with the Rebel Ducks, and we saw that with uh, the Kia uh, thing tipping over. So the financial crashes. When you have a globally integrated system, uh, they've become much more pervasive and potentially much more costly. But it's going to be hard to avoid the benefits of being part of that system as well. This is we still want containers, even though sometimes they fall overboard, and we still fly, even though they sometimes crash. So the question for countries is how do you maximize your macro potential regulations and avoid speculative capital for that purpose? Uh, and debt burdens that will subject you to the problems associated with financial problems in the United States that emanate uh, and, and affect uh, go around the world. Some countries may do that more successfully than others. Um, traditionally, it's been a big problem for Latin America uh, because uh, uh, our, the sin syndrome of sort of big capital inflows and outflows, um, but you may are learning uh, how to manage those things uh, more, more properly. Um, in terms of the dollar, you know, dollar dominance, uh, this is something that Mary Eidenberg has written a lot about and free to his works. Uh, once you have a uh, sort of reserve currency in the world, it takes a lot to dislodge it. And uh, the question is do other countries want to dislodge it and are there alternative payment systems or uh, uh, currencies that could be used in lieu of the dollar? And despite the fact that uh, the U.S. Is, was, was responsible for the global financial crisis, it's been very difficult for countries to move away from that. That standard. So that's another case where there may be pressure to, to divert the to get away from it, but it's very, very difficult uh, and will serve the stage for lives. So it's hard to say one way or the other which way it will go in that way, but um, certainly in terms of payment systems, you know, China and Russia, they're trying to design the dollar per se, this is payment systems. There's a, a lot of concern about US dominance of that uh, and alternative banking and something else. Thanks, uh, uh, Alex Robson from the Productivity Commission. Great talk. Um, I wanted to get your views on the implications for Australia. So, small open economy, we've relied on trade a lot for our prosperity. Our major trading partner is China. <laughs> our most important ally is the United States. Um, and in addition to all of that, we have the Inflation Reduction Act, Made in China initiative, 
European equivalents of, of those kind of industry equivalencies. And what would be your advice to policymakers here, given that environment? Well, it's a very challenging and difficult environment. I don't envy the task of trying to keep both sides happy. Uh, from what I understand, my limited understanding is, is Australia's done a very good job of navigating that. Um, and you've also with, with, uh, stood some retaliation on the part of China uh, relatively well, and then has allowed, forced, not forced China, but China has sort of lifted some of those uh, sanctions and, and bans in the past. Um, you know, it's very hard to say because it depends on a lot of what's, what's coming down the pike um, and uh, the risks of, of increased um, uh, tensions over Taiwan, South China Sea. Um, I'm not sure I'm in a position to advise Australia how to do that, but uh, obviously, you know, uh, globalization is a huge benefit in terms of trade improvement since early 2000s or so. It's just been off the charts, off the charts. Um, and but you know, dependence is a two-way street. So there's a reason why China didn't hit the iron ore and coal and some of the other commodities. Uh, you know, why maybe you can go through without their alternative sources? But uh, Australia has a, a position of strength that will insulate to some extent in being so uh, important in terms of minerals. And it's not just gonna be those, but it's gonna be the ones that involve in the green technology uh, as well. Uh, so you have to use those strengths as best you can and, uh, and hope things remain cool so that you aren't forced to make a hard decision about choosing sides. Uh, because the US, it's very easy for the US to make hard asks of other countries because we don't pay the price. Uh, and so uh, we do that with Europe. Uh, in terms of uh, technology from China and uh, Russian sanctions and things of that sort, because it affects them a lot more than us, but uh, the US is really put, putting a lot of pressure on them. So that's just a diplomatic challenge that Australia is going to have to uh, uh, confront and work out as best it can. I'm Timo Hankel from the Research School of Economics here at ANU. Thank you very much for a very informative and entertaining talk. Very briefly, you highlighted the benefits of globalization, pointed to the reduction in the, 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 the reversal of divergence, conversion of incomes across countries, and showed how um, obviously geopolitical problems can reduce or, or create problems for uh, uh, globalization overall and therefore trade. But what about internally? Um, what about, for example, shifting income distributions within countries? Uh, how does that interplay with what's happening across sovereign borders? Is that something we need to take into account? Do we have any lessons that we've learned? Um, and what would they be? A great topic, a very important one. Um, I'll talk mainly about the US. Uh, I, I know that. There is a debate in the United States about uh, whether one of the three president comes elected in 2016 to to the fragmentation domestically uh, and the increase in inequality that has occurred precisely because of trade or things of that nature. Um, and I, 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 I'm not sure I buy that, that that's what the driving factor was. Now, um, it wasn't a China shot, it, it affected US manufacturing mainly in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Uh, the permanent, what has been permanent damage uh, done to certain communities that uh, have shifted their political preferences. A lot of papers have shown that. I'm not sure that's the margin on which we're getting the political change. So, for example, I mean, well, there are so many things to be said here. One is that trade protection doesn't undo that, that damage. It, it should focus us on the social safety net, on job creation. You have some point where you can the low at the moment. Um, and has been for some time. Um, but uh, you know, um, there's certain regions of the country that have not done well. Um, people in the young Midwest that have lost them. If you look at why they haven't done well, currently it's international competition, but there are a lot of policy those states have in terms of labor regulation, taxes, what have you, that a lot of other states, mainly in the South and the West, to attract foreign investment, to attract domestic jobs uh, away from that. Um, so it's not just International competition has led to this division, it, it's something else. Uh, that's not necessarily a majority of the United States. For example, I know if you talk to officials in the Biden industry, they will attribute Hillary Clinton's laws in 2016 to the credit to the partnership. But if you ask people about the credit to the partnership, how many people really know about it? It's not a <laughs> day. There's something else. There is a cultural divide, uh, not only voting on NAFTA and the TPP. So 
definitely going to uh, have some concern about uh, and, and first of all, these problems, even if great, you get more trade integration, they not an issue. We have AI coming and some of the other technologies that's going to be disrupted for the workforce that we're going to be thinking about. Uh, we're just worried about the trade side, that's sort of history that happened. Uh, and also, you know, bring out a negative kind of China shock as their population falls by the size of the US over the next 20 or 30 years or so. Uh, so a lot of the path records are being receded. Uh, so a few more things to be said, but uh, uh, that I think the moment. Uh, uh, hi, uh, uh, how are you? Um, thank you very much. Thank you. So, thanks. Wonderful talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, sense of history and all that. Uh, one thing you didn't talk about a lot is the movement of people as, a, as an aspect of globalization. So, wouldn't you be inclined to put that in that hopeful thing at the end, hopeful slide at the end? If you think of you think of perhaps movement of people, you think of higher education globalizing quite rapidly, tourism is income elastic as incomes uh, increase. Uh, so the, West, the Western side is aging rapidly, need for you know, sport and labor of all kinds. And um, the hope, not always true, but the hope is that you know, travel sort of reduces those barriers and suspicions and therefore makes it a bit easier to return to globalization. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, that's the optimistic side. That's right. The pessimistic side is the U.S. has a border crisis yeah. on our southern border, and it's not acting in a way that's going to facilitate politicians saying, yes, let's open up more visas for skilled workers, and let's accept more workers because our workforce is aging. It's, it's exactly the opposite. I think that was something behind Brexit and some of the problems the European Union has, has as well. And you might think the most aging societies where populations are declining, such as Japan and Korea, mm -hmm. might be saying, let's throw open our doors to migration. Um, and it's not happening there. They're saying, we'll build robots, take care of the old people. We don't want uh, people from other countries. So it cuts both ways. Uh, and um, you know, I think coming back to Africa sort of being a, a very important continent for the future, the population pressure is there. And with Europe being right on, on that, you know. The easiest place to go across the Mediterranean. That's sort of going to be the next nexus for uh, where these migration pressures are going to be. Um, I know less about uh, East Asian situation, but certainly that's what I'd be looking for. And I'm not sure Europe is looking forward to accepting a lot of uh, people from Africa. So, yes, globalization creates ties, travel, and what have you, but um, I don't see a lot of change in terms of openness in terms of uh, migration, but we do have an expert here on global migration and over the course of history you might have some words about that at some point. Yeah. Thanks. Hi Beck, this is my team Mary Astor from the Music School of Economics. And thank you. This is a very engaging talk. I just wanted to talk about the link between the consumer and trade fragmentation. So as you showed incomes have been increasing dramatically and we've never been as rich as we are now. And we've never consumed as much as we we're consuming now, and we've never traded as much as that we're trading now. Do you see a role for consumers in mitigating upcoming trade fragmentation? You know, consumers might start to panic about their next Apple phone, their next iPhone. Is there any role for consumers in this? Unfortunately, at least in the US trade politics, uh, consumer interest has not been paramount. <laughs> and um, so, and they're not really well organized, and it's hard to see if you take a country's growth rate. So, for example, the Congressional Budget Office said the Trump tariffs cost us about 0.1 or 0.2% of GDP. So, if you ask people about that, they're not going to really feel it. It's taking growth trajectory like this and moving it like that. And so, it's hard for people to see at the time. If you're denied something and you just can't get it, then there might be some upset. But if it's just foregoing future benefits from having access to markets or what have you, it's very difficult to coalesce and get a uh, uh, political reaction or consumers to, to uh, push on that. Some countries where that's more important, uh, their number back then stays on Latin America. And uh, that, that seems to be a place where you're importing a lot of goods that you don't make. And the price of the matter rock from the person power of someone's income. And free, freer trade policy has been sustained supposedly in this literature because the consumer interest is so great that once you expose people to the grind and get used to cell phones, 
try to close that off and dump your own cell phone industry or something like that, it doesn't apply to it. So that's that's one of those forces I think that it is, is preventing a complete unraveling uh, is that um, you know, you're not going to make it yourself, you're specialized, and so you want to keep consumers want to be happy when they see other countries or consumers in other countries have these things, why can't us? Right? We can't have that as well. That might work. In the US, I think it's just a little more um, diluted to have an impact. Yeah. 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 We will have um, social function at work, so there will be more opportunities for you to write questions. So I just want to um, turn our website to the public. If you want to Thank you very much, Ichiao. And uh, I would like to just start by thanking everyone for coming along tonight. I'm Paul Burke. I'm head of our economics department here within the Crawford School of Public Policy. Uh, thanks for making it out to an event. It's great to see uh, audiences come out to hear about such important uh, topics uh, such as tonight. Also, a big thank you to Associate Professor Ichiao Zhou as well for all of the work going into organising the lecture. We do have a reception waiting for us outside, uh, but before we go out to it, I would like to thank our speaker for tonight.